Longi School yeah. of Music, in case you don't know how to pronounce it. We are Longi School of Music. I am um, Aaron Zafini. I am the director of teacher education at Longi School of Music. So thrilled to, to uh, introduce Missy Strong Smith. Mr. Strong, sorry, Miss. I just did it too. I just did because I was reading. This is name. my maiden name. It's not. I know, name, but I just put it like that on Facebook, which confuses everybody. I know, and then I got thrown off because somebody was keeps my students away from my Facebook account, which is a nice. Just, I know, I know. I just did it. <laughs> anyway, just so you all know, we're recording this session for today. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat, so um, if you have things that you want to place in the chat, go for it. For sure. Um, and without further ado, I present you Missy. Hey, everyone. Well, uh, it's nice to kind of see you. I see lots of names that I recognize. Uh, I am, uh, I'll, I'll confess, I'm like thrilled once I start, but all the way up until about 15 minutes ago, maybe not so thrilled because I'm just tired. Hey, Margaret. I just did PD with you like four days ago. Um, so I'm tired, as I know all of you are. So I really respect that you are here. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, if you saw me on social media, you know, I went to sleep at 445 in the morning and woke up at 645, taught a full day, uh, came here and now behind me that you can't see I'm packing to teach tomorrow and then fly out to Boston. So it's a crazy life we all lead. So I'm, I appreciate you being here. And we're here to talk about um, something that is, uh, I'm sure near and dear to everybody's heart, um, for sure. In the past five years or so, I've become more and more um, invested in talking about fostering belonging in the music room. And this is a kind of an outcropping of the work that I started in uh, my doctoral years with uh, neuroscience and music and learning about how um, in early childhood, the development of neural pathways uh, as it pertains to every part of development for children, but especially learning and then especially music. And in the last 10 or 15 years, the research is really now starting, well, it's just broadening. So now lots of things are being looked at. And I started being um, intrigued by these things that I was seeing about um, how a student uh, or a human being desires belonging is such a powerful mechanism for learning. Uh, so look at technology, I'm going to share with you. Uh, and if you're from Massachusetts, and don't come to my presentation on Friday, because this is basically well, it's a shorter one of that. Um, I joke, but it wasn't a joke to me for many years. This was kind of my dream class back in the day when I first started teaching. Uh, I'm a person who's kind of personally chaotic, but I really thrive on like silence and peace. And uh, when I first started teaching, I'm not proud to admit, but I'm honest when I say that, you know, 29 years ago, my idea of a good class was a class who would kind of sit and be angelic and be silent and take in all the great information <laughs> that I thought I had for them. Um, but I came to learn that this is not only expedient for what you're trying to get accomplished, but it's just not uh, developmentally appropriate for students. So uh, since that time, and over the past years that I just shared, I've really come to prioritize um, not just my musical goals for students, but goals that speak to who they are as human beings. Something that if you've heard any of my podcasts, I've kind of confessed that for many years, I thought of students as like an audience and I was the performer. And I'm here to kind of give you information and make you laugh and make you like music. And those things uh, still hold true, but there's so many things that are more important. Uh, and I'm gonna share these with you. And I just wanna tell you, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this list. It's a huge list. 
uh, the list I'm sharing is what I'm leaning into as a human being, as a person who gets to work with uh, young children. So I'm gonna show you the things that I prioritize in my classroom uh, when it comes to working with kids. I'm also gonna move this little picture of everybody over here. Also technology hates me, so just be prepared for something to go haywire. So I want my students, I wanna start in my school, which is pre-K to fourth grade, um, to create a space for students and relationships with students where they feel like I'm comfortable in Dr. Shang's music class. I feel a sense of, I have a place here. Um, maybe it's not my favorite, maybe it is my favorite, maybe it's somewhere in between. But when I'm here in this classroom, I belong in this classroom. Um, I want students to begin to develop empathy, which is something that's difficult to do truly. Uh, but I believe it's super important work. The more you look around our culture and our country and the world, the more you understand that we have a desperate need for uh, civility, actually, and then empathy. I want my students to both grow their musicality and know that they can enjoy being musical for the rest of their lives at some level. Some of them, a very tiny percentage, will become professional musicians. Some will do a lot of music, most will not. And so I want them to enjoy at whatever level uh, their growing musicality. We talk about dealing with our feelings and our impulses. You can go down this list and I will be sharing these slides, by the way, with you. Um, a couple things that I just wanna to touch on as I look at it here. Um, we're not afraid in my classroom to talk about uh, inequity and racism and um, issues that are becoming more and more kind of forbidden in many places. I'm kind of like, I'll just keep going forward till somebody fires me. Uh, that's, I have the, you know, I can do that because I'm old. So we definitely talk about these things and I'm always waiting. I have a lot of aides who sit in the back of the class who I know are irritated with me constantly. Um, so I know I'm doing my job well if some of the older aides are like, oh, here she goes. And here these kids go talking about things they shouldn't talk about in music. Uh, I encourage my students to learn how to advocate for themselves, for, for me, for each other. I want them to learn how to enjoy success and also uphold the success of people around them, uh, or at the very least, not try to thwart it. Uh, and I want them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter their capacity or aptitude to be musical, they belong in my music class. So uh, just, this isn't a presentation about belonging so much, although it's a big part of it. Um, important to know that human beings seek to bond with other human beings. And the bottom line is, and this becomes, I think, especially powerful for teachers and parents, the students you see are looking to glom on with somebody else. It's a very normal uh, part of our humanity. And the sad news about that is sometimes there are pairings and groups that aren't as optimal as others. And the good news is there are oftentimes things like becoming a member of band or choir and feeling that membership uh, with that group. When we see that there are lots of positive things and when we don't, the research, uh, and I'll share that with you in the slides, um, tells us that there are some pretty significant negative consequences for students when they don't feel a sense of belonging in school and in different classroom settings. So I'm just, I, I want you to just take a second, you can read through all this, uh, look at it for a second and see if there's something here that kind of resonates with you when you see one of these things. Um, when a student feels like, I like school, school's a, an okay place for me, up to I love school, school is my place to be. Here are the research-based findings for what we see in students. And some of them are super significant. 
Uh, so take a second, you can put it in the chat if you want um, something that's like, you know, either I didn't really think about that, or I do think about this a lot, and it's kind of affirming to see it here like this. Um, I think one of my favorite pieces of the data here is that we see a heightened uh, desire to engage at higher levels. So when a student feels like they belong in the music class, they're willing to roll with the things that you're doing a lot more. Um, and that seems like pretty straightforward, but the research is showing us that there's a real interaction here. When a student feels like this is my place, they feel more confident to take risks, responsible risks in the classroom. So these are the good things um that we can see when we are getting students to feel the sense of belonging and community um when we are working intentionally on these we're not just achieving our musical goals which are important of course but we have affective goals social goals cognitive goals uh, even some academic things are happening and we are also building true community in our classroom, which to me is kind of the point of what we're talking about here. So uh, lots of teachers, me, are like, I already do too much. <laughs> Please don't add another thing. And I totally get it. Uh, one thing that's happening with me in my whole life over maybe 15 years <laughs> it's taking is shedding my propensity to say I have to do the very best I can at every single solitary thing. And instead seeing, saying, I'm going to see if there's one piece of this uh, that I can do in my classroom with my students. So I'm kind of throwing the kitchen sink or whatever that saying is at you, hoping that maybe there'll be something that looks appealing to you. Um, here is a list of things that you can do in a more a practical way, but a little bit macro level, not the least of which is letting students get to know you. Now, if you know me, if you follow me on social media, I'm a just classic oversharer. So when I first saw this research, I was like, I can't believe there are people who don't do this already. <laughs> but I have learned there are plenty of people, teachers who don't feel comfortable sharing about their likes, their desires, the things in their life. But we see um, from studies that students who can see something of themselves in you uh, want to do more for you. So here are some practical, but like I said, at a macro level, kind of a philosophical level, things that you can do um, in your classroom. And everyone could be a whole workshop, but I'm gonna keep going. Uh, in my classroom, I realized many, many years ago, that if I wanted to get, you know, the buzzword like buy in from students, I was going to have to honor them as the individuals that they are and intentionally um, make them a part of the process of how are we going to hit our goals in this room, because it can be very, very difficult in my school right now. We're about a week and two days away from spring break and we are hitting the wall with students and yes charlotte is with me on that and i have to remind students we have in almost every class we've had a big talk and i'm going to share some of the things that we talk about in my classroom um i had this epiphany many years ago thanks to parks and rec and ron swanson and the pyramid of greatness uh ron swanson's pyramid of greatness i was trying to say to the students you know, we have a goal in this room. And the thing they kept saying when I said, what do you think the goal is like, be nice, be kind, think of others. And I was like, those things are all great. But can I tell you something? I'm a music teacher. So my goal for you is how can I get you to be more musical? Um, all the other stuff you see under it to me is like foundational for that big thing at the top. So that's where it started with my students when I started really talking to them about how are we going to have um, a, a kind of um, 
a music space where we feel like we're a community and everybody matters and everybody's working toward the goal. And this is where it started. Um, there's so many ideas encompassed. You saw it in the pyramid. Uh, I just used this today and Margaret was there on Friday. I told the story, my second son, Owen, and my daughter, Lorelei, came to my school and they were doing a dance with students in second grade. A second grader came up and whispered to my son and I noticed it, but I didn't get to ask him till much later. And I said, what did that kid say to you? He's like, oh, you're gonna like it, mom. He said to me, um, I think you could probably work more on being musical and less on crossing the line. <laughs> because he was spinning his sister, my son was spinning his sister around so hard when they were doing the dance that she almost fell. And this second grader was advocating <laughs> and saying, here's what we do in this classroom. And what I loved was, and Owen said, he was very polite and he wasn't, he was just like, this is what we do in music class. Like that looks fun, but it's kind of dangerous. So I thought that was very interesting. We talk about what it means to be musical all the time. Um, a second, oh, and I didn't tell you this, excuse me. When I went, got to that thing about being musical, the kids and I developed what we eventually called pillars, things that hold up a structure. Um, I don't know if that's like the architectural definition of that, but that's just what we said. And we're like, what are the pillars of this class? So be musical is the most important one in many ways, but this one is kind of in tandem for me. And that is, I am loved and I matter. And we say that, and then the students will often say, and if I'm loved and I matter, that means you are loved and you matter. And what I love is that they'll say, that means the grown-ups are loved and the grown-ups matter also. So here, this is kind of like our way of reminding ourselves that every person is a human being who has value, um, and belongs in the space. Sorry, I'm going so fast. But this one, I'm happy to say, I just talked about this on Friday and it happened today. This one is until it's my turn, I'm gonna learn how to be happy for others. Um, this has revolutionized kindergarten for me. And I kind of got nervous this week because we're doing a new game. And I thought, let's, let's walk the walk. So we talked about it and I said, Remember, we have two choices. We cannot play the game, which is the fairest way of doing this, and nobody will get a turn, ensuring that everybody has the same experience, right? Or we can play the game and you can accept that you might not get a turn. And today we did it, yesterday it happened, kindergarten and first grade. They were great, not a grumble, because I said, this is just how it is to play the game. I don't have time to ensure that everybody gets a turn every class. So this is a real practical one, a pragmatic one that works really well with students. Um, we talk about how music is a place um, for us to learn how to be brave, to take what we call responsible musical risks and to make mistakes. Um, I would show you this video. Ah, if I have time at the end, I'll come back to it. It's one of my favorites. Two extreme introverts um, doing arioso, which is like spontaneous singing time with the puppets, they're fourth graders, and they did a beautiful job. And I attribute that to everybody working together to make it not a safe space because we do want it to be safe, but I cannot guarantee their safety every second. But what we say is, we're learning how to be brave and it's not easy right to be brave this is the one that i must say four thousand times a week and this is we i want you to have fun in music class it's important to me but and i'm like don't tell anyone it's actually not the most important thing to me i do want you to have fun i want you to be safe i want you to think of the other people so what we say is have fun, don't cross the line. And I'm gonna show you, just like me talking to the kids as an example of that, uh, this is a great practical pillar to just review and we do it all the time, all the time. Um, so um, can I, would you like to see this video of me talking to the kids about it? This is before they're going to do Sasha for the first time, this is kindergarten. 
They've learned the steps and we're about to do the dance. And then it occurs to me, they are so hyped up, right? That I wanted to say this and third grade is coming into dance with them, which is gonna send them even more crazy. Whoops. It's short. I wanna just go over this before we try this dance. What is the number one rule in this community? What is the number one rule? Be musical. Everybody say it. Be, Be musical. musical. And then when we're doing something like this, I really want us to think about have fun, don't cross, cross the line. line. Close your eyes for a second and think about what crossing the line in the Sasha dance might look like. Don't tell me. If you think you have an idea of what crossing the line might look like, put a thumb up. Then if you agree with me that you're not going to cross the line, give me a second thumb up. I love that you did that so fast. That gives me hope because I have a surprise for you. Third grade is coming in. I, I was, one kid's like, Third grade class, is though. coming in because they wanted to dance with you. They just learned this dance this morning. All right, so that's just an example um, of these pillars in action. I want to just, um, and I'm just going to share some of these more practical things that I do with the students. Now, you notice I'm not saying here's a musical activity and here's a musical activity. These are the things that um, kind of are the umbrella under which we do everything. This is uh, based on the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's a mood meter um, that I created. It's nothing official. It's just my thing. Um, and I use it for students to communicate to me, sometimes uh, quietly. Sometimes everybody's doing it as they come in. It's a way for us to communicate. And later we sing about these things. Um, and when I ask them questions, they can refer to it. This is a, a, something I've been saying for maybe three years now. A strong silent hand is, so everybody do it with me, put your hand up. Um, because we have this signal in our school that nobody is listening to. Um, and then we have, I can't even finish it, but you know what I mean, the clapping. So I have the strong silent hand and they just like it because the first letters make shh, which they like. So that is hand up, um, turn your eyes and your body to the grown up and then we become as still as the floor. That's something, a movement exploration activity we actually do starting in kindergarten, where they become so still uh, that we say, if you close your eyes, you feel like you're the only person in the room. So strong, silent hand is just my way. And I tell them it's also for my voice. So that, and I'm like, my dream is not to have to raise my hand and explain what this thing is, right? Is to just do it. And it's happening. I have to work so many times with my kids and then i would say this is one of the biggest things um, that we work on intentionally and with vocabulary we talk about what are impulses um how do i identify when i feel like doing something so we talk about human beings get angry human beings are tired human beings are happy human beings are frustrated um, having feelings is not a bad thing. It's a normal thing. And I'm like, Dr. Strong goes through about 900 a day. And so the thing that's hard is what do I do with this feeling? And this morning, one of my third graders, she's very funny. She was like, Dr. Strong, and then she looked, she said, hold on. Am I learning to manage my impulses? So that's what we talk about. We don't say, oh, I can manage my impulses. Like I'm on, in the process of learning how to manage these feelings and impulses. And I use the example of my little brother. Um, I say, when I was, let's say 12 and he was eight, I wanted to punch my little brother many times. And they're like, oh, I'm like, it's the truth. Uh, and I'm 55 and my brother's 51. And sometimes I still my brother. And I'm like, what's the difference? Hopefully at 55, I've learned how to manage those feelings that are normal uh, that come up inside. So we talk all the time. So if we're playing with the stretchy band and I say, I know you have an impulse and you just want to like slam this thing against the floor or your legs. Um, 
So either I let them do it for a second or I say, right now, we got to manage that because we cannot do that because we want to be what? We want to be musical. So we're going to move and be musical. A very practical thing. Um, I will just, I just want to show you, can I do this, Aaron? Just like a couple snippets. Because I think this is um, giving you a picture of how we work through this. So here is a group of kindergartners and I won't go into the long thing about why I'm the only one singing they're learning um, a game and you will see they're at the beginning of the pillars of the music class so let me just go here this is the first time they're learning the game I'm singing it so they can audio it watch how excited they are because it could get dangerous. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Here we now go. we say, they're still screaming and going nuts. Up the hickory, down the hickory, let us chase the squirrel. Up the hickory tree, let us chase the squirrel. Up the hickory, down the hickory, let us chase the squirrel. Up the hickory tree. Um, but they're able to bring themselves back. Here is a group. Oh, I them left, left. Left. Um, this is them just learning a quick dance. This is a group that really struggles with bodily, um, just kind of keeping things calm when they're moving. And they do a great job. This is a quick clip. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Counterclockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, four to the center. In. Woo! Out. Good job. In. And bow. Hold. Here we go. And um, in the old days when I would teach that dance, the kids would try to do what do you think when they got to the center? Um, or maybe it's just my Jersey kids. You kick each other or touch each other as they're moving into the center. And then this is one of my favorite things. You've probably seen this. This is a group that also struggles um, to build community together. And look how beautifully they're working together here. First time they're trying it. One reason I'm sharing these is just to show you that when I was a younger teacher, um, these kinds of activities became so um, unruly for me, but now uh, they still tire me out. <laughs> but the kids and I work very hard together uh, to say we want to get to that super fun part and we can't do it unless we're a community of people who care about each other. And another time, I'm going to, we talk a lot about. You don't need to be best friends. I wish you would be. I wish you would all love each other. I wish everybody would be best friends with everybody, but we're living in reality. So what's the next best thing? And that's when we work on what we call civility. And we talk about how grownups are not so good with civility and we're gonna make a better world by learning how to work with people even when we disagree with them. Um, and today I'll leave my part with this when we were going to do a dance it was a partner dance and i said i challenge you to work with somebody to pick a partner um, with whom you hardly do anything in your class if you have the choice and they all did it they all went to people they don't normally hang out with in fourth grade 
And I was so super uh, stoked that they did that and they all worked together. And that makes me know um, hearts and minds are changing. So that's kind of the end of my thing. And Aaron, what do we do? Sorry, I went a little bit late. No, um, you're, this is, this is great. Um, I'm going to stop the recording real quick. Pause on that.